The women that I learned about in school were, you know, the infamous women in history, white women in history. I learned about Helen Keller and, um, <laughs> Helen Keller is all that comes to mind. <laughs> Maybe Amelia Earhart and Florence Nightingale. Just a few, huh? That was, that was years ago. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Maybe it's better now. For me, I'm sure I've learned about several. There's Helen Keller, there's Harriet Tubman, there's uh, Sojourner Truth. But these were, this was uh, very surface level and just the very basic facts. Like Helen Keller was blind and deaf. It was. It was. Like in our society today, is just something that you have to learn on your own. Just you know, you just have to research it by yourself, or just if you're just into stuff like that, you want to be like you want to be as the same position as a man, then you have to go out and get it. Feminism means um, the advocating of equal rights for all people, regardless of whether they are men or women, and it just means a sense of equality amongst the genders or sexes. Feminism, uh, it's for a female to be independent and to basically take care of herself. There is no male in her life to do her stuff or to fight for her or to give her money. That, you know, there's issues, currently current issues about, you know, female and male and how females don't stand out much as men. And so, um, I really haven't heard of the word sexy, so I really can't explain it like that. That's okay. Um, well, actually, I didn't even know there was a women's history. I think there probably should be. To the extent that most people don't realize that they are, um, you know, advocating or supporting sexism. So sexism is an uh, is a um, unfort very unfortunate part of our culture, and unfortunately, um, linguistically and even culturally, uh, people of both sexes help to uphold it. But unfortunate, but um, hopefully in the future, uh, that will kind of fizzle out, but it won't fizzle out without uh, people actually taking the conscious effort to acknowledge the sexist uh, features of our culture. Beautiful women, strong women, smart women, independent women, all of the things that I aspired to be. Women stepping up. That's not what I want to say. The words are hard. Women fighting for equality. Women fighting for things that I, I can't. <laughs> Would you consider yourself a feminist? I wish I could. I want to. But like I said, a lot of the things that where, where sexism experienced is so implicit, I feel like I, I don't have the, the cognitive tools to recognize it yet. And to really fight it as I want to. You know, I can look at the, the outward things and say, no, that's wrong, but I know that at a level that I probably still do sex, sex, uh, sexify women in a way or, or, or look at women in a way that I wouldn't find okay with if I saw it, or, you know. It's getting deep right now. <laughs> do you see that ever changing in the future for yourself? Yes, I'm, I most definitely do. Our history. My name is Linda de la Garza. I am a professor in the Department of Chemistry at Valdosta State University. Um, my name is Dr. Derek Drake, and I'm an assistant professor of physics here at Valdosta State University in the Department of Physics, Astronomy, and Geosciences and Engineering Studies. Well, my name is Stephanie Hennerschitz, and I am currently an assistant professor in the History Department, and I specialize in United States history. Oh, my name is Leslie Sandra Jones, and I, and I say both of my first names because I actually have kind of a split persona. Okay. My name is Tracy Woodard Myers. I'm the director of the Women's and Gender Studies program and a professor of sociology. My name is Katherine Oglesby. <clears throat> I'm a professor of history in the Department of History. Um, I'm Dr. Ann Price, and I'm an assistant professor of sociology um, here at VSU. Um, so if you could just give some information about your career and your career history. 
Okay, well, um, I... Uh, well, hello. My name is Bobby Tickner. I'm an assistant professor, uh, tenure-track assistant professor here at Alaska State University. Uh, I'm Susan Whaling. I'm a professor in modern and cl classical languages. My name is Shelley Yankowski. Um, I am a... My position is kind of interesting. Um, I am a temporary um, adjunct professor. I think. <laughs> um, I think like a lot of women my age, and this is probably going to sound um, a little corny, but I think a lot of us <laughs> were actually really interested in history more generally since we read uh, the American Girl books. <laughs> um, even if we couldn't afford the American Girl dolls, because they're very expensive, but a, a lot of um, females that I've talked to who are historians, that's the first thing that they say from a young age, reading those books was very, very important. And it was really important to me. Oh, well, I'm not in physics. And then I took my first upper level physics course, and I'll never forget, the professor, Mr. Massejan, wrote a equation on the board. And I looked at that question and said, I've seen that before. That was in my math class. I just did that yesterday. And it was like a night, it was a light bulb that turned on for me because when I saw that equation and he started explaining how it relates to a top spinning about its axis at an angle, you know, those little kids spinning tops, we it was an equation for that. I was like, oh, so that's what it was for. And I was like, oh, I got a major in physics now. So I realized that physics makes the math make sense, which I loved. I guess my interest uh, really started very young. Uh, I lived in an inner city uh, environment that was uh, one of the most dangerous cities and uh, areas of the town in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, saw a lot of things going on around me, saw a lot of things from my own parents, um, and always kind of had an interest into why people would do some of the things that they do. And I really didn't know at first if I was going to enjoy it or not, uh, but as I got kind of into the classes and actually had conversations with the students instead of like talking at them. Um, I, I really enjoyed it and I feel like it was just kind of this big amazing academic conversation and uh, a good flow of good ideas were just going and we were able to just address like really serious issues like uh, gender inequality and racism and social uh, stratification and equality, I mean, just all of that stuff. And um, I, I kind of fell in love with it. When I teach, I teach from an inequalities perspective, and so I think the combination of the sociology background, but also um, identif not not identifying, but um, a ally, you know, becoming an ally for the women of color in the movement, you know, and the continuing oppression that they experience, even in the feminist movement. You know, has made me stop and look at intersectionality. Kimberly Kim Crimshaw is another one, you know, very influence, influential in my career. And so I think looking at it from an inequalities perspective and from an um, intersectionality perspective. As in what I think feminism means is, first of all, recognizing that there is uh, or there are structures in place that make it more difficult for women to have access to um, certain things that men have access to, so basic rights, um, you know, opportunities, things of that nature. So I think you, the first, I guess, goal of feminism is just realizing what exists and what is in place. And as a historian, looking at how that might have changed over time or, more unfortunately, how things have kind of stayed the same. Um, and then from there, you know, what are you going to do about it? And who should be involved in this? And so I, I always try and, and define feminism for students as it's just, it's recognizing that there are things like patriarchy and paternalism um, and sexism that affect not just women, but men as well. Um, I mean, these systems really do create a lot of restrictions for um, males in terms of what they should be allowed to do, what they can do. And so I, I, you know, not undermining or not dismissing the extra challenges that, that women face, but that there are these very sexist, oppressive structures. Um, but it's mostly about just trying to create a level playing field. Um, and then to get a little bit deeper there, history, if you look back through American history, all the other issues about, you know, what African American women or minority women have to experience um, compared to white women. I mean, there's just, 
-hmm. I think overall feminism is about equality. One of the, the big criticisms, people always say, well, why be a feminist? Why not be like a humanist? Or why not just be egalitarian? That doesn't recognize that there are groups of people, right, whether it's racism or sexism or ableism, you know, there are groups of people that there are specific issues that they deal with um, that, for example, white men do not deal with, or even issues that African American women deal with that African American men don't necessarily have to deal with. Um, so all that being said, I would definitely, I, I'm definitely a feminist, and I know many feminists, and I know many male feminists who are not afraid to say I'm a feminist. Um, so I do think that it's it's very important, and I'm not sure if I defined it in a very good way, but <laughs> but that's kind of um, how I how I see it. I think I, I, I probably popped out of the womb as a feminist. I don't, I don't know that, you know. What I do, what I try to do now is value. Like, when I grew up, people like were really about women in the workplace, and I don't think that's a great thing for children or the family or the community. So I don't care who stays home, but it would be nice if our society would support the role of somebody caretaking children. I think to have... Um, somebody needs to be a, a nurturer, a caretaker. That's a really important part of biology and our survival as a species. With it. And um, the fact, early feminism just supported this sort of equality in the workplace. And I, I don't think that's the direction that feminism needs to go. And I think that um, that needs to be addressed. Um, as a feminist, I'd like it to be addressed that I that we should support whoever wants to stay home and raise the children and our work structure should support that and our pay should support that so that we don't have to both work it, because I don't think that's healthy. I'm not really sure. Feminism has changed. It used to be this, you know, women's rights and trying to get women to vote and everything and then it kind of went through this cycle where everybody was a feminist and if you worked and you were to school and you were automatically considered a feminist because you were breaking the mold. And now it's kind of in the political realm, it seems to have a derogatory nature to it. Uh, nature to it. It's like it's a bad thing to be a feminist. So I'm not sure how people define feminism anymore. I mean, I'm a woman, I stand up for what I believe in and take care of myself, and I believe in that every woman should have the right to, you know, health care, every woman should have the right to be helped, every woman should have the right to have time off, pay time off when they're going through childbirth, you know, that's a big deal, and then right afterwards they should have, you know, there's a lot of things that I believe in, but I don't know if that makes me a feminist or just a realist. So yes, I would consider myself a feminist, and to me feminism really means equality. Um, it means equality for everyone, not just females. <laughs> so everyone. Egalitarianism, if you will. Um, and that's kind of, that, that flows really well with my discipline too, with anthropology, because anthropology is all about embracing diversity and understanding diversity. Um, so it would just not work if you were not um, a, a feminist mind <laughs> to study anthropology. You know, empowering women, um, basically, I mean, there's the there's the different ways that people think about it, but basically the idea that women should be full citizens in society, so that women, you know, should have all the rights and um, opportunities available to me. I guess showcasing how great it is to uh, be a woman and try to... I think we have so many responsibilities if we want to take on them. For example, if we want to um, have a career and a family and a partner, um, it could be overwhelming, I guess, so, but at the same time, it's um, satisfying. Uh, I think we put a lot of it on ourselves. I think that, and it's not always the case, certainly, I'm in a relationship with someone who, if I needed them to, would give 80% and I only gave 20 and that would be fine and that would even be short term or long term but I put it on myself that no no I want to I can do all of this you know I can be a professor I can be the good friend the mother the wife you know all the roles that we have to play but in some ways I enjoy that I enjoy 
being the glue that keeps it all together. You know, so fairness, sometimes, you know, you wish people would step up a little bit more. Sure. But at the end of the day, um, I'm comfortable enough in my own skin to say, you know, what if I don't want to do that or I can't do that? That's fine. I'm not going to do it. And so I think as women, when we reach that point, you know, then the guilt goes away. Yeah, the expectation is higher. Um, but I think that most women who value both just find a way. You never figure it out completely, but you, you just find a way to be the mother or the grandmother or, you know, the daughter now, the issue. The biggest issue for me is trying to take care of my mother long distance who's in assisted living and having health issues. But um, you have to be those things. And the, it sounds hokey, but if you got to be an example of, and sometimes I'm not. It's, it's just, it's too hard. <laughs> you know, it's hard to do it all. But, um, but yeah, and, the, and what I would like to be a part of is, is creating a world that, where all of us do that. It's not a woman-man thing, so. Um, you know, pregnancy can still be seen as, by some people, as sort of something that's debilitating or it's really going to affect your productivity. And of course, you know, that's that's not really the case at all. Um, it, of course, you know, varies by women, but um, often, you know, you just sort of, you're doing your regular life and then you're going to have a baby eventually. So um, some of those things have occurred. And the same with, you know, having young kids. Um, and you, you know the studies that have shown, for instance, that if men have photos of their kids in their offices, um, if they talk about their kids, they're seen that improves their status in the workforce. They're seen as, you know, being able to do their job and additionally being seen as a family person. And women, um, it's, I've made a point of, my, I'm just into my new office, so I don't have this set up yet before, but I've made a point of sort of, you know, defying that by having lots of photos, you know, big 8 by 10s etc. of my kids in my office because it's an important part of my life and I want to, you know, promote the idea that women can do that. But of course, you know, when I was at Ohio State, for instance, you would see the female professors that would have, they have kids and they would have maybe one photo on their desk of the child facing them and then they would have, you know, photos of their awards, degrees, research trips, um, those were the sort of things displayed in their office, and I know, you know, just, of course, this is, you know, the N of one, the, few, the just talking about a few cases, but there was, you know, for instance, you know, a male assistant professor who had his door papered with photos of his children, several other male professors who had them more on display, so I think it is still the, um, the perception of women that they want to, that they feel to get ahead, they need to, um, keep their family life under wraps as much as possible. So, For one, I think it's important to say that I'm a part-time faculty member. Um, and I think it's also important to note that a majority of the individuals who teach in my department that I serve under, the Women's and Gender Studies, were part-time. And so sometimes I wonder if that has, it may not, but I, I, I take a position of curiosity and I wonder does that have anything to do with are what we talk about, women and gender studies. I mean, is there a reason why this isn't a full-time program with a major instead of a minor with a full-time faculty staffing it? Um, so things like that make me think about, you know, does the gender component, not necessarily being a woman, but teaching about women and gender identity and gender differences, if that affects the perspective of, oh, we don't, we don't want that to be a full-time thing? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions. But uh, it does make me think, you know, I wonder, I wonder. One of the biggest ways in which I've had to, to be very conscious of being female is that I've, it is not so much because men have treated me in a sexist way, but student expectations here, more so than when I taught in the state of Iowa, are that women will be soft and generative and um, are, are soft and nurturing. When I go out into the prison environment is, I think, where I see it the most. Um, one, because I do focus on rehabilitation, I think the default is 
you know, oh, she's some bleeding heart liberal and wearing her Birkenstocks as soon as she leaves here, you know, and, and of course I'm a female, so it must be that I'm just nurturing. And I have to say, okay, I'm, in, I'm this is an important issue to me, not because I just want to save everyone in the world and I want to be this nurturing mother. That's not it at all. I want to stop victimization. I want to stop the cycle. And oh, by the way, it can save you a lot of money. And so I have to kind of position things a little different. But sure, I mean, anytime you walk into, you know, two careers, you know, one computers and another, uh, uh, you know, computer or uh, criminal justice working in prisons, it's male dominated. And, uh, you know, I have to talk differently a little bit. And maybe that's not fair that I have to do that, but in some ways, whatever gets me to the goals that I need to achieve, I'll do them. Yes, for sure. And that's another thing that I have a uh, hard time drawing line with because I think that Some of us have got to be nurturing, but you have to, where do you draw the line with students? And so that's, um, I am to some extent enriched by nurturing and being nurtured. You know, it's, um, we teach and we learn. We do both in, you know, everybody in the classroom. But I, I think uh, they certainly, students certainly do expect of women and what's off-putting for them, or, or what's shocking for them, is the women professors who don't want any part of that. And I totally understand that. And it may not be because it's their nature to not nurture. I think it's probably just that not knowing how to handle the nurturing and then the drawing the boundary. The students all the time will not use doctor with me. They'll say Miss, Miss Susan or Miss Whaley. And I will always say that in your class, like, titles are not a big deal to me, but I know that you do not call your professors Bob, Mr. Bob. I know that you probably say Dr. So-and-so. I've seen it. That I've noticed as far as, like, for example, when I got the, the title Doctor uh, in 2013, um, I gave my students the option. They could call me Dr. Ramirez, or they could call me Professor Ramirez. And I teach undergrad. If I taught graduate, it would be AJ. But I try to keep some sort of um, structure in the class. And um, I noticed that I was getting a lot of Miss Ramirez instead of Dr. Ramirez or Professor Ramirez. And um, I just kind of started talking to some of my male colleagues, you know, their experiences. And, and you know, this was in my small, maybe talked to maybe two or three male uh, colleagues. None of them had that problem of anybody calling them Mr. So-and-so. Um, in fact, they didn't even get called Professor So-and-so. It was always Doctor. And so I kind of wondered, did my gender play a role in that? It wasn't until I got into, you know, my master's program and my PhD program that I really started, you know, in an area where I thought, surely, there would not be any of these issues. Um, and it was the exact opposite. It seemed just far, my eyes were like opened, right? And the more I read and the more I read about um, feminism and feminist theory and all of these different things, it all became very, very clear that there are deep, deep problems. I and mean, then again, not even, I don't even have the time to get into all the problems that um, minority women face in academia there. It's, it's even more difficult and I don't think that's something that is talked about um, enough. Sometimes women feel like they have to act like a man, especially if they're in a in a designated leadership position. There I I worked for a woman at my first faculty position and and she had just taken on all the attributes, the worst male attributes, and accumulated them all and treated us worse than any man I've ever worked for in my life. So I think the interesting thing is when women are working in, in predominantly male disciplines like the sciences, um, you sometimes pick up things like that and behaviors like that. And that, I think the course that I had taken as a doctoral student made me very conscious that when I'm put in leadership positions, I don't want to behave like that. Because um, having been through some, some bad experiences, I, I try to, try, I've been trying to be conscious of how I shaped myself and how I thought about things and how I behaved because as a tough tomboy I could certainly act like that. It would be very easy for me to fall into that. Yet I find that's not the person I want to be. At one time I told students to get out and they didn't get out. You know, I mean they just didn't see me as an authority figure at all. I had to go get the department, I had to get them out. So 
Um, I don't think that there are policies and stuff, but I definitely have seen um, unwritten rules, you know, and again, this, the sexual assault, you know, it just basically said, don't do it. There was no definition, there was no what will happen to you. And then five, uh, a paragraph higher was all about hazing, and there were like five paragraphs, what it is, and so whose voice was at the table when those policies were made, you know? Not somebody that had to worry about sexual assault, but somebody that was worried about hazing. So I think I see a lot more of that and a lot of exclusion of women at the table making the decisions. And then women in helper roles that are supporting or su supporting staff of the people that have the power that the women are really working really hard. And then the, the men in the roles, the white men in the roles are getting all the benefits and all the you know. you know, we have a really diverse student body. That's one of the wonderful things about teaching at VSU. And it would be wonderful if we had more diversity in our professors um, to mirror that because we know that students identify with those who have those similar characteristics to them. And as far as reaching out to someone and feeling supported, that really helps a lot. I think um, our university will benefit a lot on probably the diversity issues are quite important. We noticed that special case last summer. Um, we need to support our students and make sure that they have a place to, you know, show their interest and their thoughts and be able to, you know, to guide them in the appropriate way. I really, really hope that we can get the. Um, you know, and this is not just BSU, this is across the country, but uh, get university, academia kind of back in, back in order. Um, I hate the direction that, that things are going more generally, you know. Um, so, we talk about the McDonaldization of, of academia, this is scary. This is, this is not a, the kind of learning environment anyone wants to be in. It's not a learning environment if you could continue this. So I'd like to see that um, fixed. But how, and you know, that's another story. But um, I'd also, just for myself personally, I'd like to have um, a job. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep doing what I'm doing because I love it. The, the most rewarding thing for me so far has just been being able to get in the classroom and teach and seeing, people, seeing students learn, you know, this aha moments, those are awesome. <laughs> they make your day wonderful. And um, the, the cool thing too, and it's kind of egoistic, is that I get to learn. So I'm always pushing myself. And so it's like I'm a forever student <laughs> as well. And that is a lot of fun. The, the rewarding thing for me has been that I have been able to use my research in the classroom. That's one of the, uh, that's a, a reward that you can't really top. You know, I would say one of the positive things is just having the opportunity to work with a lot of first-generation students like I was. So that's been something that is overwhelmingly positive, um, but yeah, uh, challenging, I would say. <laughs> yeah. I'm generally happy. There's so many wonderful things about um, being a professor, um, and I really do appreciate all of the you know, the flexibility, the ability to mostly, more or less, be your own boss, right? Of course you have, you know, people to, that you um, need to respond to, but it's so amazing to be able to have that time in your office and just um, decide how you're going to divide up your own time. You know, this is the time I need for prepping teaching, and this is when I meet with students, and this is my time carved out for my own research, which usually gets smaller and smaller, but it is, um, it is such an amazing job. I, um, yeah, I can't imagine having another. Uh, my advice to female students will be that if they want to teach, that they choose an area in which they are really passionate about, something that they want to keep learning, um, because being a teacher is uh, being a student most of all. You have to be on um, current on what it's out there, even if it's methods of teaching and, of course, in your area of specialization. So it's a lot of reading and uh, a lot of um, being still a student of your of your field so that we do it just keep going mm -hmm. and when we were at conference they were a little intimidated i think because i took them to the national 
meeting for the American Physical Society's Division of Plasma Physics, mm -hmm. which is a lot of men every room. And they, I think, were a little intimidated. And I said, don't be intimidated. Walk in there with your head held high, because the truth is, you are doing something that they are capable of doing. And mm -hmm. you're no different than them. You have the same mind. You can handle it. Just go for it. So when I see women who want to do this type of field and work in it, I just say, go ahead. Why not? Don't let anyone stand in your way. So if you do what you're passionate about, then everything will fall into place. So whatever you're really passionate about, defining that, doing the research, reading about it, um, is really good. I think it would be um, to, to always persevere um, and to, to try to have an open mind when you're in a field that's dominated uh, by men. Um, so it would be to kind of think about your experiences, feel your experiences, allow them to, to be a part of the journey that you're evolving through. However, take time to really think about how you want those experiences to affect you career-wise. What you want to do. You know, what, what, is, what do you want to not do, but what do you want to accomplish? And something in you is, is prepared for that. That's, that. Something is motivating you that's, that's a core thing. And I would say you have to do that in spite of the um, obstacles you're going to encounter. And, but I say this very guardedly, very guardedly. On many college campuses, like here at BSU, you know, the Women's and, and Gender Studies departments, they are excellent, excellent resources um, for, for anything, any questions that you might have, and if you end up at a university or a college for your master's or PhD degree, or even, you know, here now, work very hard to protect those. Um, even if you, you might not see your work or your research as, as necessarily lining up with that, so even if you're in a hard science or you want to go into biology or chemistry, don't overlook you know, what those programs can do for you. I think that's, that's another thing, is always being aware of the resources that exist um, to help you and to help overcome some of these challenges that you're going to face. So for, I know that sounds a little dreary, but I think just knowing what you're getting into would be my best advice. See, I think students have a lot more power than they think, you know, uh, especially now that it's almost like a consumer, you know, customer service, you know, to keep the students happy so they'll stay here. So I think students have a lot more power. I think if the if the faculty would organize, you know, but I think everybody's scared of, of this administration right now, um, especially after people have been fired, to speak up and speak out. But I think that students could say, this is not acceptable, you know, this is not what I'm paying to come here for, you know. Confidence. I mean, that's number one. Um, and I see this so much, mo much more than the male students. I see it in female inmates, is the lack of confidence that we have in ourselves. Um, you know, you don't even want to answer a question in class because, you know, what if I'm wrong? You know, I'll be embarrassed. Okay, well, what if you're wrong? Who cares? This is the time to be wrong. This is the time to work all of those things out. You know, this is the time to explore and, 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 and understand yourself uh, and it took me a long time to get there it took it took me a long time to to be confident to say you know I can't control the people around me but I can control how I think how I feel and the actions that I take When you think of female professors, what are some words or phrases that come to your mind about them? They're my favorite. Um, they are amazing. They remind me that no matter how real the struggle gets with school and people telling me there's really no point in you doing that, I 
I just looked to them and I remember, yep, I can, I can do this. This is no problem.